So talking about the existence of God, uh, part two, we're dealing with the philosophical apologetics. And the philosophical apologetics is the primary group of apologetic disciplines. You remember earlier on we talked about there's historical, there's scientific, there's all sorts of different kinds of apologetic approaches. The philosophical approach is especially concerned with the existence of God, arguing either logically or um, in, in other philosophical ways other than pure logic that God exists. Last week, we talked about the ontological argument, um, which is one of the most difficult and one of the most challenged, which says that the very fact that we can conceive of a greatest uh, conceivable being, that the, by definition the greatest being would be more, would be greater if he were real, that is concrete real, and not just in my mind, so if it can conceive of a greatest conceivable being, then he must actually exist, or else we wouldn't be able to conceive of him. So the very idea of being able to conceive of God is one, one argument demonstrates that that, did, that proves his existence, philosophically, logically. Now again, that one's been attacked a lot, but it has continued to be brought up. It started, um, the, the primary formulation was in the 11th century by Anselm of Canterbury, by René Descartes. Um, more recently, versions of this by Alvin Plantinga and William Lane Craig, who's the author of your, of your books. By the way, did you have any questions from your reading this week? I forgot to ask you that. Any questions? Are you doing good with the reading? Are you doing the reading? Mm -hmm. All right. And was I correct that the already defense Josh McDowell is very straightforward that your Christianity is easy to read but makes you think hard? And then there's William Lane Craig, who some of you are probably struggling with. Am I right? Uh, oh, he's easier than the philosophy text. Okay, well, William Lane Craig <laughs> is probably second only to Alvin Plantinga in terms of being the uh, a influential Christian philosopher these days. Those two names will pop up a lot. Nobody touches Alvin Plantinga in terms of importance as a Christian philosopher. But William Lane Craig comes closer than anybody else, I think. Nicholas Waltersdorf's name comes up. He especially has dealt with uh, theology of aesthetics and things of that sort. But anyway, ontological argument. Second, cosmological argument, which says that because everything that exists has a cause, nothing can be the cause of itself, that there is a sequence of causes, but there cannot be an infinite uh, regression of causes. It can't go back infinitely into eternity. I'm not going to get into the argument about why you can't have an infinite regression of causes again this week. You can go back and watch the video. But because of that, there had to have been any first cause, which is related to the idea of prime mover. The analogy I, I made up on the fly last week is if you see uh, dominoes that are bumping into each other and they're each knocking the next one down, that's cause and effect. You know. One domino is the cause of the other one falling, and the cause of the other one falling. Well, it makes sense to you, I'm sure, that at some point there had to be a first domino. That would be the first cause. And whoever pushed that first domino would be the prime mover or the first mover. Those are arguments for the existence of God, that it all had to start somewhere. That's the cosmological argument. The Kalo cosmological argument says the same things. It's, a, it's a, an argument from cause, but it goes further and says that um, defines the nature of the God who created. So it's the design, the uh, cosmological argument, plus it recognizes that the God who caused all things to be could not himself be caused, which means he's not part of the created universe. He has to be outside the material world, outside time. You know, he has to be um, personal because there was an intention involved in starting that first thing. He had to be conscious of, of that. And so it goes further and actually argues the nature of God from the cosmological argument, okay? And again, we talked about all these in detail last week. I'm just giving you a, a real quick resurvey. The teleological argument is the argument from design, saying that in the same way that the, the watchmaker analogy, in the same way that we find a watch, we logically uh, assume that there had to be a watchmaker. Well, the complexity of the, of the universe is much greater than any watch, and so there is likewise a rational belief that there was a a maker, a creator of the cosmos, in the same way that there was a creator of a watch. And again, the complexity of the, of the cosmos is, is so far greater, you know, even though you can't hold it in your hand uh, like what you can't watch. And then the fine-tuning <coughs> theological argument starts with modern, uh, that is especially the last 40 years or so, 40, 50 years, scientific discoveries about the number of things that have to be fine-tuned to a very minuscule degree in order for life to exist. And the likelihood of all those things that science has discovered in recent years, 
being exactly what they are to make life possible, the odds of that happening are far beyond anything reasonable to believe it happened by chance. There is inherent in that detailed scientific aspect of design the idea somebody had to plan all that because it wouldn't all come together. Uh, one, one analogy has been that the number of finely tuned things necessary for life to exist, the probability of all of that would be the same probability as someone flipping a coin and getting heads ten quintillion times. Um, it is beyond any reason in terms of likelihood or probability. Okay? So that's the fine-tuned scientific teleological argument. Any questions about those? All right, today we're going to talk about the moral argument. Actually, I have one sign up here. We're going to talk about the argument from freedom. Moral argument, the transcendental argument, the presuppositional arguments, and presuppositional is sort of a category, and I'm going to start with that, actually. This is not the right order. And then we're going to talk about reformed epistemology. Reformed epistemology, uh, which began with Alvin Plantinga, argues that belief in God is properly basic, to use those terms. In the same way that it is assumed that it's properly basic, apart from a disability, for people to be able to see with their eyes and hear with their ears and taste things with their tongue and feel things with their touch, that the ability to perceive and believe in God is also a properly basic sense that humanity shares. And apart from, you know, if someone has a disability and their eyes don't work, then they're blind. Well, the idea would be everyone doesn't believe. That is a disability. There is a lack of a properly basic sense capability, and that is the ability to sense God. We'll talk about that, all right? This is all just teaser. Um, I mentioned as well, you might want to go on sometime and do a search of um, Peter Kreeft. Peter Kreeft, K-R-E-E-F-T is former uh, professor of philosophy and theology at Notre Dame. He is an evangelical Catholic scholar and uh, also very funny. I mean, if you read some of his stuff, he's got a great sense of humor. People who know him would not. Um, some of his lectures are available online. You can hear him speak. And on one of his websites, he's got 20 arguments for the existence of God. Some of these we've talked about, some we haven't. If you think the ontological argument stretched your brains, then try a few of these. Um, the argument from contingency and some of the others, because they're, they're brilliant, but they're also not easy. All right? Let's talk about... Why is, this, this thing jumps around when I convert it to this computer. Um, I tested it all before, but I don't know. Let's talk about presuppositional arguments for the existence of God. These are arguments that the basic beliefs of both theists and non-theists, that is, people who believe in God and people who don't believe in God, require God as a necessary precondition. And let me explain that a little bit before I go on to the steps of the argument. This is based upon the, the clear and obvious point that all people have presuppositions. Those are the assumptions or understandings that we use as our basis for all other judgments. Um, and everything that we think, everything we communicate, is based upon whatever presuppositions we have. And in the case of talking about the existence of God, we have presuppositions either in favor of or against the idea that God exists. Now, um, the presuppositional apologetics claims that, that presuppositions being essential to any philosophical position there are no neutral assumptions when we start talking about differences in Christian views or, or theist views and non-theist views. These arguments, for instance, don't, don't argue for the existence of the Christian God, although that's usually assumed, or Jewish, the Judeo-Christian God. It, it argues for a divine being that is the creator. Uh, but the, the assumption here is you have one set of views or another. Nobody is lacking in presuppositions. Nobody is really neutral no matter what they say. You start with some kind of presupposition. Um, and the argument for Christian presuppositional apologetics is that if you follow logically the non-Christian principles or presuppositions, they will lead you to absurdity, including those arguments that exist in other religions, you know, if you pursue the carnal. Now, so we say, everyone has certain points where they begin their thinking. Um, we call them presuppositional because there are beginning points. So the argument goes like this, with that preference, that uh, 
that uh, preface. All people have certain presuppositions on which they base their perceptions, their understanding, and their communication. You can't get away from that. And nobody argues with this part. Secondly, persons who insist they do not believe in God still hold and act upon presuppositions that demand the existence of God. Like inherent order in the universe, uh, freedom, which I'm going to talk about, morality, which I'm going to talk about, because this is kind of a category of subjects, and we'll talk about a couple of examples. Reason, objective existence, etc. What we're basically saying there is that people say one thing, but they live a different way. And I'll give you an analogy. This is an analogy which was offered by Richard Taylor, quoted in John Hicks' book, Arguments for the Existence of God. He says, um, for the sake of you Canadians in the group, two men are riding on a railway train. And as they're riding through the countryside, they look up on a hillside and uh, there are white rocks have been arranged on the hillside that say, the Canadian railway system welcomes you to Canada. Well, one of these two men looks at that and goes, boy, it must have been a lot of work to take all those little white rocks and put them up there, in the, you know, in the, in, to make that sign, the Canadian railway system welcomes you to Canada. Well, the other fellow says, well, why do you say that? I think those, those rocks just accidentally happened to roll down the hill and stop where they stopped, and so, you know, that's what we're perceiving. And the other guy says, how can you possibly say that? We can read the sign. The guy says, no, I think it's all an accident. Now, at this point, that's the design argument, right? Same argument as design, which is a complex result that has a particular purpose, in this case, a message. You say somebody did that on purpose. That's the design argument. But these two guys are in the railway train, and they disagreed about this, and the one guy is just, I can't believe you think that's an accident. Well, they, they continue along. After a few minutes, the second man, the man who said he thought it was all just accidental, he says, well, we need to get off at the next stop and change our money, our American dollars, into Canadian dollars. And the other guy said, well, why do you say that? And he says, what do you mean? We just saw a sign that tells us we're getting ready to enter Canada. And the first guy said, but you said you didn't think that was intentional. You thought that was just an accident. The idea that you do not accept intentionality, and yet you live as though you really believe it's true. The fact is, nobody who says they don't believe in God is willing to live by the consequences of that. Because that would mean there is no order, there is no reason, there is no rationality, there is no you know, freedom, there is no morality, there is no nothing. It's like David Hume, the great Scottish cynic, um, he said, he, he argued conclusively, nobody's ever been able to refute this, that while cause and effect may exist, you can't count on it. You know, the, uh, the idea that any given cause, if it's exactly the same every time, will create exactly the same effect. He used the billiard example. If you hit a cue ball with a cue, with the same force, at the same spot, the same spin, everything is equal, and it strikes another ball in the same place, Cause and effect reason would say that that's, that ball that's struck by the cue ball will react the same way every time, right? David Hume argued, you don't know that. All you know is how it's acted every time before. This time, you could do all the same things. You could have exactly the same cause, and you hit that ball with the cue ball, and it goes straight up. Or it goes down through the table, or it jumps to the left, or it jumps to the right. He said, because you have experienced something in the past, does not mean you have a guarantee it will happen exactly the same way given the same cause in the future. Now, nobody's ever really refuted that. But if you apply that to your life, nothing would ever happen. In fact, David Hume himself said, well, yes, philosophically, that argument is sound, but you can't live that way. If I thought every time I flipped a switch that a, a house in San Juan uh, Tacoma Lawn was going to explode, if I didn't know that the lights were going to come on instead, if I didn't have any some sense that for that cause there was a predictable effect, if I didn't know that if I planted, you know, if I planted corn and I knew it was corn and marigolds come up, I'd starve to death. We all would. We cannot live with the cause and effect not working. And David Hume recognized that. He said, yeah, you know, it's, it's true, but you can't live that way. That's exactly what this is saying. People will say, oh no, that's all just an accident. I don't believe in God, I don't believe in any of that. But they can't really live that way. The inconsistency between what they say they believe and what they accept in their life is indefensible. 
unless there really is a God that has ordered things and underpins all things, then they can't claim all of the things they claim. They can't live their lives the way, their lives the way they live. They can't just say, I deny the existence of God, and then go on about their daily affairs as though that doesn't change everything. Because it does. And I'll give you some examples of that. Therefore, there must be a God. Now, this presuppositional arguments for the existence of God, presuppositional apologetics, does not look for the classical apologetic, classical historical or traditional arguments for the existence of God, like proofs or evidence. It is dealing entirely with, <coughs> given where people come from when they say there is no God, what their presuppositions are related to that, if you pursue the consequences of that with regard to everything else in their life, it is absurd, it's illogical, it's irrational, it's completely inconsistent. So make up your mind. Either dig a hole and crawl into it and don't come out again if you really insist on demanding that there is no, there's no order or morality or freedom or divinity in the world. Or else recognize that, there is, that you really are living your life as though you believe that is true. Does that make sense? Ernest. The basic premise that one must be a theist or a non-theist where does the agnostic fall? Is that sort of a neutral? An agnostic is a non-theist. A theist means someone who believes in God. An agnostic says, the only difference with an agnostic, he's saying, I don't believe in God because, because there's a reason I don't think I can know. But he has not confessed to believe in God. Still is a non-theist. Yeah, so theism and non-theism are the two big categories. Within non-theism, there's agnosticism, there is uh, atheism, there is, you know, I'm sure there are other categories that aren't coming to my mind right now, but... Uh, so it's either belief in God or not belief in God, and not belief in God could be only because I'm not sure yet. Okay, fair. Um, any questions about that presupposition? It means if you make a statement that God does not exist, are you prepared to live with the consequences? And the fact is that people aren't. And I'll give you some examples of why they aren't. This is the argument from freedom. Get all the pieces up there first. The argument from freedom, the argument for the existence of God from freedom, says people insist that they are free to choose their own destinies. Nobody wants to say, oh, yeah, I, I, I don't have free will. I don't have the ability to decide my own destiny. And yet, if they deny the existence of God, de facto, they are claiming that the world is not ordered by a divine being. Therefore, determinate naturalism exists, meaning materialism. Evolution, the theory of evolution says you have no control over what you are, how you got there, or where you're going from here. It's just going to happen to you. It has and it will. That determinate naturalism provides no basis or option for such freedom. Personal freedom is only consistent with belief in eternally free and sovereign creator God who's made us in his image, including having the freedom to choose. What that means is you don't accept God, then you de facto accept the fact that you are living in a world where all the choices have been made for you. You are simply a speck of matter. You don't have, you know, you have no more consciousness, no more freedom, no more control than a tree. You just simply have to have a little more mobility. Ultimately speaking, you don't have any more control or freedom. So the argument, people insist they are, they are beings, should be an S on that, they are beings who are free to choose our destinies rather than victims of determination. Belief in personal freedom is only consistent with theism, never with determinate naturalism, therefore God exists. You understand what I mean by determinate naturalism? That you can't control anything about yourself, your life, where you're going with anything. It is all chance. See, materialistic world says everything is basically chaos. It is all chance. It is going to happen and you can't affect it. Because if you say you can affect it, then you somehow are more than just a piece of Beat in the world. Okay. Materialists, determinate naturalists say you're just a cow with a slightly bigger brain. And you have no more control over your ultimate destiny than a cow does. Really. Got that? That is what materialism says. That is what determinate naturalism says. That you know, the, the nature of the world, the, the random laws of nature decide what's going to happen, not you. I don't think we like that, do we? We're not comfortable with that. And 
yet the atheists never tire of telling us that we are only chance products of the, the movement of matter. You know, matter moved around in the world and boom, there was rocks. There was no intentionality behind that, that there's no purpose, there is no, there is no value in human striving, it, what will be, will be. And that given that picture, then there is no room for freedom. I have no real freedom. And I don't think we like that. We're not ready to accept the atheist view of reality that says that I cannot be in any way really free. I am just a product of a random material universe. Marvin? Uh, it seems to me that we take a, a, a softer path, feeling like we do have choices, whether we get up or stay in bed or whether we go to work or go play. Or, and so we get so involved in our own little world that we don't give it a thought for the future world. Uh, you know, I don't well, think yeah, that's a different thing. issue. I mean, yeah. that's true, but that's not, you know, the, the, the thing that you're talking about um, making making choices based upon what we desire as end results or whatever. Yeah. But I'm, the, a, an atheistic materialist would say, you're not really making any choices at all. I'm just going that I don't think most people are willing to argue from this argument or, or follow what they believe to the end. They, they're too busy thinking they have choices and not thinking about what's going to happen. Right. I mean, even death, they don't want to even think about that. They don't want to talk about it. You know, don't talk about it. Right. You know? And that's... Uh, that's basically what I was saying, because this is a category of the presuppositional. If your presupposition is that you are just a product, a random product of a material universe, and not anything special at all, then one of the things is that you have no freedom. And it doesn't matter if you get out of bed. You know, um, some people would say, that well, it's just all a matter of random chance anyway. Nothing you do is going to affect it. It's all going to basically end up where it's going to end up. So stay in bed. Don't stay in bed. Get up. Don't get up. doesn't matter. Eat, don't eat. Um, this, and that leads to not only, uh, uh, I think some of the hopelessness that our cultures tend to fall into these days is because they actually begin to start struggling with what it means. If I'm just a particle of matter in this random materialistic universe, I don't really have any freedom, I don't really have any value. Then some of the hopelessness that people suffer from, the increase in suicide and everything else, is one of the end results of people who actually do start considering what naturalism, materialism takes you to. Um, that you, you don't have any, you're not going to make any progress anyway, so I might as well kill myself. Yes? So, when you talk to them, they always say, well, when you die, you're disgust. But what happens when they have a, a child that dies? And where do they go with that? How do they, I mean, what, their child just becomes dust? How do they... Deal with that. Yeah, you make a good point, and that is that people people's circumstances often have radical effects on their <clears throat> philosophies. You know, people who have children, all of a sudden, people are not just random specks in the materialistic universe. All of a sudden, they realize that there, there is some inherent value in that. You know? And the question is, do they recognize the, re the impact that that logically, if they're being consistent, that, that that realization that their child is more valuable than just being a piece of meat in the world, do they are they consistent in recognizing that that should lead them to acknowledge the fact that there is a greater power? And, and that gets into the moral argument, you know, uh, which we'll talk about next, which again is a subset of this presuppositional. It boils down to the fact that people do not accept the consequences, really, of their own insistence that there is no, there's no, there's no divine power. There is no maker. There is no creator. There is no higher power. There's no nothing but just we're just bags of meat. And we're here and then we die and we go on the ground. Are you really prepared to accept the consequences of that, or is there not something in you that says that doesn't ring true? I think for everybody who's serious about it, unless they despair, they back up just like, just like. Um, uh, David Hume said, well, yeah, but you can't live like that. And you, you start, and then if you're consistent, you start backing up and saying, well, if I'm prepared to say you can't live like that, then that means I'm prepared to say there's something wrong with that, and if there's something wrong with that, what does that leave me with? It leaves me with the concept of God. There's no other place to go. You're either theist or you're not theist. There really aren't other options. Okay. 
Let's look at another presuppositional argument, which also is very strange how that stuff pops in. Um, I test all this before I come here, and it all comes out at the same time, at the right time. It's, yeah. And that's the moral argument, another presuppositional argument. This argues that if there is any real object, objectively valid moral values, then there must be an absolute from which those values are derived. The argument goes like this, a human experience of morality is observed and is common to all people, or, as Peter Kreef uh, phrases it, uh, moral obligation is a fact of human existence. Secondly, God is the best or only explanation for this universal moral experience, therefore God exists. Now, where have you read about this recently? C.S. Lewis, good for you. Uh, Lewis's book, Mere Christianity, the first section is called Right and Wrong as a Clue to the Meaning of the Universe. And he makes the argument in here very compellingly and, and succinctly and clearly, which is why this is the most important Christian book of the 20th century, that everyone, no matter what they might, how they might try to argue it, everyone has an inherent sense that there are some things that are good and some things that are bad. There are some things that are right, some things that are wrong. And you can, people argue social, you know, social motivation that one society has a different set of values. And Lewis makes it very clear that that's not true. There's never been a society that thought that selfishness was a good idea. Now, they may have defined what you're allowed to do that's considered selfish or not selfish, but in every culture there's been a sense in which, you know, selfishness is not considered okay, that you do what you want and need to the exclusion and to the damage of someone else, always. Um, there's, people say, well, murder is acceptable in some cultures, but only if it's the murder of somebody who's outside your tribe. Well, they say, well, some people believe in cannibalism, but there's never been a culture that thought it was okay to boil and eat your own baby. So the point is, no matter how you slice or dice it, there is, ev in every culture, every human society, every human, there has always been a sense that some things are right and some things are wrong. So the question is, where does that come from? For somebody to say that is wrong suggests that they have some sort of inherent sense of what's right and what's wrong. And some people would say, well, you know, um, it's all it's all just chance, there's, there's no real good, there's no real evil, it's all just basically ethical subjectivism, what you want, etc. They say that until somebody does them wrong, and then automatically they start screaming, wait a minute, you can't do that, that's not right. Well, based on what is that not right? You didn't like it? Is that the only, you know? Well, no, no, it's more than that. Because if you didn't like it, then whoever's stronger ought to be able to do whatever they want. And yet people go, no, no, no. The, the example of the child. Well, it's just a bag of meat until it's my child. And then there's clearly a right and wrong with regard to how my child is treated. And now my child ends up, or whatever. So there is, when you say that a, that a stick is crooked, can you, only, can you not only say that based upon the fact that you know what a straight stick should look like? So if you say something is wrong, is it not because you have some inherent sense that what right is? Something is bad because you have an inherent sense of what good is? Well, where does that come from? Ernest? The moral argument that is God is moral. Well, yeah, and even more to the argument is God is the source of our perception of moral. Because, you know, by definition, if there is some higher law of nature, as, as uh, Lewis called it, which tells us that there is good and bad, there is right and wrong, where could that come from except from a being which is above us? Because we're not, none of us is up to setting a standard for what is inherently right or wrong for all humanity for all time. That comes from someplace outside us, and yet it is the product of a mind. There is a mind that is big enough and has been around long enough and is great enough to come up with a standard that we all inherently appeal to without even thinking about it. And that, by definition, a mind greater than us Long, around longer than us, setting a standard that we all appeal to, you very quickly get to a definition of who God is. Lorette, did you have first and then Lynn? No, I didn't. Okay. Lynn? Yeah, I um, keep thinking about 
Nazi Germany. And what happened to the German people that those who had theistic beliefs, belief in God, did not say realistically, what you're doing is, is all wrong, it's all wrong, your religion is all wrong, if you believe in a God, it's all wrong. Right. What, is that um, like a, a force of evil through an individual um, brainwashing, for lack of a better word, uh, against logic? Well, when you get into a specific example like that, there are a huge number of issues, historical, sociological, etc. But um, you know, the, the German people had been so devastated by the reparations that the Western powers put on them after the First World War. The economy was broken. It literally, in places, was cheaper to burn money than it, the paper money than it was to buy firewood. People were starving in the streets. Uh, it was horrendous. And so, when, the, when all that started, <clears throat> the idea was that, well, yeah, giving absolute authority to somebody making the chancellor and then ultimately pledging, <coughs> if he's, if he's going to let us feed our children, then that's, that may not be good, but it's a lesser evil. Okay. And so you get into a lot of that kind of thing. So it wasn't was, really uh, uh, moralistic. Well, but it was. It, it was in the, re in the sense that there were always people, both outside and inside the Nazi party, who knew this was evil, who knew this was wrong. I mean, we have the documents from the Nazi party, and we know some of the most, what appeared to be the most dedicated of uh, people within the Nazi party acknowledged in private, you know, private uh, memorandums and stuff that they, that they knew that they were, this was not a moral thing, but, but in order to maintain power they were willing to do it. Um, and so there was always a sense of that. I mean, there were the, the most horrendous of the Nazis who were part of the gangs that, that uh, they had special uh, groups of troops that as they began to move into Eastern, you know, Eastern Europe and take over more and approach Russia, they had specialized people who would go out and, and find Jews, find gypsies, find other people that were considered undesirable for it. And they had to convince themselves they were less than human. They had to come up with some justification. And those groups of, of soldiers would, they were um, extermination squads. And they would kill those people. But they discovered even as hard as they tried to make those people hard, Etc. etc. et, cetera, et cetera, they frequently had difficulties with those guys at some point breaking because there was something in them that knew no matter how indoctrinated they were, no matter how much of this they had done, they often would have these guys who would break down and say, I can't do this anymore. And so, you, you, you know, there was a knowledge of evil. almost proving. Exactly. Well, that is, you know, I, we believe this is absolutely inherent. Now, that does not mean that people who are, who have chosen to be evil, who have focused on their own appetites to the expense of others. That doesn't mean people don't do that. It just means that every human being, whether they're listening as closely to what they know inside is true or not, people will still satisfy their own appetites. They will still do evil, no question. But even, for instance, the reason why the nations of the world gathered together to fight Nazi Germany was because there was a universal sense in which there was no sacrifice too great in order to stop this moral evil. Okay, understand? I mean, if you look at World War II, uh, specifically in Germany, some of the churches were either silent on what was going on for a start, you know, and then you had uh, some courageous Christians that would speak up, like Dietrich Bonhoeffer. The Confessing Church. Yes. Yes, you know, and uh, I mean, still to this day, right? the Catholic Church has never excommunicated Hitler and number of the leadership. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, they have to sort of excommunicated themselves. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, but the confessing churches did that uh, motivated from self, from survival. I mean, so the self-interest. That doesn't mean they didn't know that it wasn't wrong. Didn't know that, you know, people don't always. In fact, Lewis, um, in the end of uh, <clears throat> one of the first chapters here, in the first section, uh, he says... So here are the two great truths. I'm not going to find it this quick. But the two great truths are, here it is. These, then, are the two points I want to make. First, that human beings all over the earth have this curious idea that they ought to behave in a certain way and cannot really get rid of it. That is the feeling they should behave in a certain way. That's the first point. We have an inherent sense of what's right and wrong. Secondly, Lewis continues, that they do not, in fact, behave in that way. 
Now, when we say that moral law exists, that people know that some things are right and some things are wrong because there's an external uh, uh, referent, there's an external uh, standard to which they, they have to appeal, doesn't mean they always do it. Don't make that mistake. And Lewis makes that point in here. The people know the law of nature. They break it. These two facts are in the foundation of all clear thinking about ourselves and the universe we live in. So whenever we look at examples, Nazis are always a good example of everything bad. Um, <laughs> People knew that was wrong, and they still went along, out of self-interest, or out of profit, or out of satisfying their own appetites, or out of prejudice against people that the Nazis were against, or out of retribution against the Western powers that had done this to them, or whatever. Doesn't mean they believed it wasn't wrong. It doesn't mean they believed it was right, because as he points out, we know what's right, and we still don't do it. That's the brokenness. Loretta. They've done experimentations where they put somebody in the room and the person on the other side turns up the dial. Yep. And an actor on the other side is pretending that it's they're turning up the heat and the people are you know that are turning the dial are squirming and they go to the authority that right. says turn it higher even though they know it's wrong, they obey the authority. Exactly. The, the authority experiments where you know they they keep turning up this rheostat as though they're increasing the electrical power and somebody in the next room is screaming and they're go, and they're feeling really bad about this, but the person who's running the test says, oh, no, it's okay. This is important. Go to the next level. And they keep doing this and the screams get louder and more horrendous and louder and more horrendous and the people very consistently still did it. Almost nobody in those tests said, I'm not going to do this anymore. Grace? Inherent awareness of uh, good and bad is what we call conscience. Yes. Right? Yep. Yeah. And where does your conscience come from? Mm -hmm. It's not just a biological thing, you know, because um, other, other creatures don't have that. And if you think your dog knows the difference in good and evil, he doesn't. Nobody loves their dogs or anthropomorphizes them more than we do. But the fact is, they know what they're liable to get punished for. That's not the same thing as knowing the difference between good and evil. Okay. Uh, Stan, you got something else? And then Mark? Yeah, the word is uh, pacifism playing all this. Like, my, my, my father-in-law was a conscientious objector. He was a member of the Mennonite Church. Yeah. You know? Well, yeah. we, the, the idea, a, a person makes the decision of how far does their judgment of what's right and wrong. See, Unless somebody is mentally broken, that is a sociopath, nobody believes that killing someone else is okay. They may believe that there are circumstances in which it is necessary. All right? That doesn't mean, you know, people who fight in wars, the vast majority of them, if they're mentally healthy, they, they're not pleased about the fact that they're having to kill the enemy. But they believe it's necessary to defend their homes or to, you know, or to stop an evil or whatever it is. Well, a conscientious objector, a pacifist, simply says that they're, the line where they draw what is morally good and, more, and, and what is good and what's bad, what's right and what's wrong, they would draw it at the point of taking any life is bad. And so there's not a difference in the idea that there's good and bad, there's right and wrong. It's just where are they going to draw the line? And that's, that's a matter of degree. Not, it does not in any way change the idea that we all have an inherent sense that some things are good and some things are bad. And that, that those... Those things are very consistent in the human existence. We don't have a huge variation in that. It's not just a matter of social adaptation. Societies don't differ on this thing in any significant way, only in matters of degree. It's not okay to kill whoever I want, but some people it's okay to kill, and societies may differ on that, but nobody agrees it's okay to kill whoever you decide to. Again, unless they're mentally ill, so, you know, a sociopath. <coughs> well, we can all sit in this room and agree that it's bad to be greedy, it's bad to be dishonest, and so on and so forth. But when we go to the door, most of us will engage in those very things for, for whatever the reasons are. And even if this brings us to a conclusion, oh, therefore God exists because there's the morality. Okay, we say God exists, but how can I get him to do what I want? <laughs> We're not interested to follow through and say, what does he expect of us? You know, we're just, yeah. how can we appease him, or how can we get him to help us be richer, or right. whatever, you know? Yeah, it, that's true. Although that doesn't apply to the philosophical argument from, from morality in terms of the existence of God. You, you're right, we do. I mean, that's sort of the practical application as Christians. Mm -hmm. But the issue that, that everybody has a sense of right and wrong. We may draw the line in a slightly different place based upon our appetites, or upon our society, or whatever. But where does any sense that certain things are right and wrong come from unless there is some standard that we all appeal to inherently? 
That's the argument, the moral argument. Okay? And again, people who say, I don't believe in God, don't have any other place to look. I mean, they, they try to say, for instance, that this is just, you know, societies decide what's wrong, what's right, based upon survival. You know, that, that doing good is simply an extrapolation from, from self-interest, from human survival. There's a problem with that. Human beings down through history, some of the most noble acts, the things that have been considered most noble and desirable have been when people sacrificed themselves for the sake of a greater good. If this was entirely an issue of survival, which is one of the very few you know, arguments against this people would make, then why do we see people sacrificing themselves, sacrificing their own best interests, accepting pain and grief and all sorts of things for what they consider to be a greater good? It's not just a matter of survival. That doesn't work. And yet there really is no other explanation for where we get this sense of good and bad. Right? Let's go to the next argument. I'm going to twist your brains a little bit more here. Um, this is what's called the transcendental argument. This argues that all of our abilities to think and reason require the existence of God. The argument goes like this. If there is no God, and most often when we say this, we're talking about the entity God is defined as the God of the Bible or Yahweh, the Judeo-Christian God, then knowledge, especially as related to absolute statements of logic, is not possible. And I'm going to explain that in just a second. Knowledge is possible, or some other statement pertaining to logic or morality is possible, therefore God exists. Now, let me explain that, because the second one, um, well, the first two points are difficult. Um, we believe, everyone believes, no one challenges the fact that there are absolute laws of logic, particularly the three laws of logic, which are often called the laws of thinking. You guys have heard me talk about this a lot, because some of the traditional philosophical arguments for God have to do with, uh, and, and, and that not all religions can be the same, for instance, not all versions of God can be the same. Uh, are based on that. The three laws of logic, or the laws of thinking, sometimes called the logical absolutes, are the law of identity, which says A equals A. Something is what it is. It's not what it not is. Okay. Something is what it is, the law of identity. And you go, well, duh! If you don't start with that, then you get all confused. A cat isn't a dog. And one cat is not another cat. It is what it is. Secondly, the law of non-contradiction. Something cannot both be and not be at the same time and in the same way. Another way to say that is something cannot be both true and false at the same time and in the same way. That's one of the basic laws of logic, absolute logical value. Which means if I say Jesus was the Son of God and someone else says he wasn't, we can't both be right. We may both be well-intentioned, we live in a world where we both have the right to say that, but we cannot both be right. That would be illogical. So, law of identity, law of non-contradiction, the third one is the law of the excluded middle. Something is either A or B, it cannot be something else. Okay? Um, there is no third option. Something is either true or it is false. It either is or it isn't. Can't, there's no in-between. And people say, well, something can be partially true. All that means is you can divide it in some way so that one part of it's true and one part of it isn't. But anything is true or not true, it is or is not, it, there's no in-between, no, it's, it's the excluded middle. Now, those are absolute values that are universally accepted as being true. So, let me give you the steps on this in a, a different way. One, logical absolutes exist, nobody questions that. Those three laws of logic at the least, there are other logical values as well, but those priority three. Secondly, logical absolutes are conceptual by nature. There is nothing in the physical world that will prove what I just said. I can use an analogy like cats and dogs. But law of identity, law of non-contradiction, law of the excluded middle are simply cognitive. They're conceptual things. So um, we can't look, you know, they're not dependent upon space, time, the material world, human nature, physical properties, anything else. They're entirely conceptual. Third, these logical absolutes are not the product of the physical universe because if the physical universe were to disappear, those logical absolutes would still be true. Since they're not part, you know, they're not built on the physical universe, they're not dependent upon the physical universe, even if the physical universe went away, those logical absolutes would still exist as concepts, as conceptual things. So, four, 
Logical absolutes are not the product of just the human mind because human minds are not absolute. How can my mind, which is finite and limited, come up with an absolute logical truth which is not dependent upon me or the physical world or anything else as a concept? There's, it's something outside me. And fifth, since logical absolutes are always true everywhere and they're not dependent upon a human mind, those things were true before you ever heard about them, for instance. Okay? They were true for you even if you didn't know it. They're not dependent upon the human mind. It must be that those absolute values are transcendent and that a transcendent mind is responsible for authoring them. They are conceptual, they are in the mind, they are not dependent upon a human mind, they are not dependent upon anything in the physical world. The only explanation for them are that they must be the product of some mind and that it is not finite or non-absolute as ours is. It must be the product of a mind that is absolute and transcendent and that by definition is God. Or else we would not have these absolute logical concepts. Does that make sense? Anybody want to argue with that? You can. I didn't make it up. I'm not going to take it personally. <laughs> um, Carol. I don't want to argue with it, but maybe this is what you mean by those parenthetical things. There are a lot of other concepts that are outside of existence, like numbers. And right. I mean, there are other that. abstracts. So is that, do those count? Or could you do the same argument with that? Well, whenever you talk about, uh, I said knowledge is possible or some other statement pertaining mm -hmm. to logic or morality, and then, you know, the moral thing comes into, into this, etc. There are a lot of things. The logical absolutes are the clear ones because people accept those. Um, anytime you talk about an infinite concept, our minds are not capable of dealing with infinity. And yet, for every x, there is an x plus one. The basic number set, excuse me, the basic number set is an abstract infinite. Mm -hmm. Well, where do we get this idea of an abstract infinite? I certainly can't wrap my mind around that. I don't know of anybody else who's ever been able to, Einstein or Hawking or anybody else. We cannot, we know these things exist, but we can't wrap our heads around them. Nobody came up with them. Where did they come from? If not from an infinite, transcendent, absolute mind. And so, yes, morality, that falls into that. The issue of freedom falls into that. Where do these things come from? The very definite, when you define them and follow the logic, the only source we can find is a source that by definition sure looks like God. Right? There are a bunch, these are all the presuppositional arguments. Okay? Um, and in fact, if you wanted to follow this transcendent argument in, in the full, this is in 12 point type, you know, I've got 20 pages here of the, of the premises and conclusions from that. I've given you the shortcut. But from a, a point of view of a logical argument, they, it's not like they just tossed this one off. There's been a lot of work done on it. Pam? I'm just curious. Hawkins is supposed to be such a genius. Hawking. Hawking. How is it that he cannot understand this reasoning that there is a God? <laughs> It's like I had, you know, Greg Vogel asked me after the sermon on Sunday, you know, he said, Ross, you explain the Trinity, and it's very clear, and why do people not get that? And I said, well, because they're not as smart as us. <laughs> I say that flippantly. Um, remember the thing about presuppositions? That every conclusion you draw is fundamentally based upon what your presuppositions are? Stephen Hawking, and Dawkins, and Hitchens, and Denning, and all these guys, they start with a set of presuppositions that will not allow them to accept this. That's why it's called presuppositional. In fact, the people who are really radically into presuppositional um, argumentation for God or presuppositional apologetics would say, you might as well not even try to convince them because there is no point at which atheistic presuppositions and theistic presuppositions will meet. It's not going to happen, apart from God doing a miracle. You can't, you can't convince them of this because their presuppositions will not allow them to accept this. Stephen Hawking, Hawking has been very clear in saying he doesn't believe in there's a God. He doesn't believe in creation. He doesn't believe in all that. He has those presuppositions, and no matter how smart he is, no matter how many times he reads these arguments, his presuppositions will prevent him. He will always be able to find an excuse. Now, I'm not picking on him. I mean, you, you raised his name. Um, <laughs> But that's true with anyone. I, you know, I'm not thinking of you either. 
Um, I, I'm saying I'm only using him as an example because you, you mentioned him. But that's the whole point of this presuppositional approach is don't start with physical evidence or even logical evidence. Start with the presuppositions people have because ultimately that will drive what conclusions they accept. And yet our point is within any kind of open-minded presupposition status, you can argue for morality or transcendence or transcendentalism or any of those other things, you can find a presuppositional argument for the existence of God or else those things could not exist because they are outside our ability to conceive them. Uh, yes, Is that also reason? true with the Jews that cannot see and cannot hear, they're blinded? Well, we want to make sure that we're talking about philosophical and logical experience here, apart from the spiritual. And, and Marvin, for instance, with the example you gave earlier, uh, I didn't mean to sort of set that aside, but you were taking it to the point of spiritual application, which is not what we're talking about here. Okay? Now, that's, there, there's a spiritual blindness there that they have to be open to. Um, I sort of ran into this in philosophical theology. A couple of times people would say, well, what about the Holy Spirit? And I'm going, well, yes, I'm not denying the Holy Spirit, but that's not what this class is about. <laughs> this class is about logic. It's about philosophy. It's about natural theology, which is not the revelation. It's not a revelational issue. It is using the other gifts God has given us, our cognitive abilities, you know, our rationality, logic, our, our sensual perception. So when we're talking about this, these things, we need to be, and, and that's not in any way to say this is more important. This is just a different class. You know, if you attended some of the other classes that I had, I'd be very much relying upon, you know, the, re the revelation of God. I talk about the fact that, that our whole faith is a, is a revealed faith. God is revealed to us um, in the person of Jesus, in the nature of the written word that he has given us, and the Holy Spirit. So I'm not diminishing that at all. I'm just saying that was that class. This one, we're talking about the logical, philosophical, natural theology kinds of, kinds of things. Does that make sense? Yeah. So don't go away saying that Ross is basically a pagan, all he does is talk about philosophy. No. <laughs> Watch the other videos. Uh, Chris? But wouldn't, if you were arguing this with somebody, you know, you were witnessing to them, wouldn't they just say that you're, you have a presuppositional position as a Christian? I mean, they would. Yeah. Well, but the, the thing is, I would say, okay, uh, and the reason why this is presuppositional uh, <coughs> Apologetics is I would I would walk them through. For instance, you know, as Lewis does, he says, "Well, all all people have an inherent sense of what is good and bad." And they would say, "Well, no, you know, that's just, that's societally determined and everything else." And you respond to that. And ultimately, you, you the the issue is you get to the point, And yes, you have a set of presuppositions. The answer to that is yes, I do. I have a set of presuppositions. Let's examine my presuppositions. Versus your presuppositions with the regard with regard to the topic of let's say moral good, and see which one of them makes most sense. Because the point of this is to follow the logical arguments to the point of saying, given moral law, for instance, you know, the sense, the inherent sense that every human being has that there's good and bad, apart from any apparent other explanation for it. What explanation do you have for that? unless there is some source outside ourselves that has established that there is such a thing as good and such a thing as evil. And so the whole point is, yes, the first thing you do is when they, if they say that you confess, absolutely I have my own presupposition. Now let's compare my presupposition and your presuppositions on whatever this particular topic is we're talking about and see which one seems to make most sense. Fair? And that's what presuppositional apologetics is all about, is examining from a reasonable point of view which presupposition for God or against God, particularly, the existence of God or non-existence of God, makes most sense given the reasonable and logical considerations. Fair? Mark? With, and without a God creating people of different minds and different presuppositions and so on, we would never have this class or any thought about how does this all work. Right. So it's the, you've got to have both in order to, to come through it. Right. And, and it is true, I mean, back to the issue of why don't people get it, um, it is true that the devil is actively working to try to fog people's minds, to, you know, to blind them. And so people don't see the best arguments in the whole world. Again, if our eyes are open, then scripture is very clear on that, that some people are blinded, and they cannot see the truth unless God intercedes by his Holy Spirit and causes them to see it. That's all very true. So we can make the best arguments in the world, uh, 
um, logical, sensible, reasonable, and yet those who are truly blinded are not going to get it. And yet we we have a responsibility to give an explanation of the hope that is in us. Meaning, and, and that doesn't mean throw throw a scripture verse out because they're definitely not going to buy that. But if we can speak to them in a way that makes sense on these issues, then at whatever time the Holy Spirit does decide to break through their blindness, and only He can do it, then they're going to have some content that they can turn to because we have to provide it. Fair? That's why this is important. Um, and the Holy Spirit can, I believe He can use these kinds of arguments. If it is His time, if it's the Spirit's time, He can use this to cause somebody to see the light. So it's not like this is only for future, but we can't expect we're going to, we are going to be able to argue somebody in the kingdom. Stan? On uh, presuppositional arguments, where would somebody like uh, Zacharias Hitchin fall into? I, 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 I don't know that name. Christopher Hitchin, I know. Zacharias Hitchin's uh, Jewish author. Oh, I don't know his work. Uh, Couldn't speak to we'll him. We'll talk about it later. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah, I... I don't read much. <laughs> it's all, it's, it's sometimes it feels like that's true. Um, okay, so the next one, which I think you all will really relate to, is the argument from religious experience. And this is a very real and legitimate apologetic argument. This suggests that the very idea of God, logic, oh, wait, 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 that's the wrong, I got the wrong slide up there. Forget that first part. The argument goes like this. I don't know why that... The argument goes like this. Many people of different eras of widely different cultures claim to have had an experience of the divine. So don't pay attention to those first two sentences under argument from religious experience. It is inconceivable that so many people could have been utterly wrong about the nature and content of their own experience. Therefore, there exists a divine reality which many people of different eras and of widely different cultures have experienced. The fact is, and I don't know of any exception to this, um, somebody does let me know because I say this a lot, there has never been a culture that did not have some awareness or sense of God, or gods, or the supernatural, or the divine, something outside the material world. <coughs> the vast, vast, vast majority of all human beings that have ever lived had a belief in the divine and, and or the supernatural. It has only been in the last hundred years, in, in our case the last 30 or 40 years, that people have said you're stupid to believe that. Anybody who's smart will not possibly believe in God. And I'm going, really? You think every other human being that has ever lived that professed to believe in God was stupid or wrong? When I mean, that would be like saying you take the whole population of Lakeside, out would have 25,000 people, 24,850 of them witnessed an event and they professed the same thing. 150 of them say something completely different. Who are you going to listen to? The 150 or the 24,850? Do we not accept in our legal system the weight of testimony? If you've got 50 people that testify to one thing and one person that testifies to the opposite, Ernest, you're a lawyer. Who do you think the court's going to listen to? 50 people or the one person, if they have contrary evidence. The vast majority of human beings have testified that they have had a real religious experience of God. It is only very recently, I mean, from the Enlightenment, there was some of that, but it really has only come into the, in, in the last part of the 20th century, to say, there is no God, it doesn't make sense, it's all just a material world, etc. Is there not some credence to be given to the testimony of the vast majority of human beings down through history who said that they had experienced God? Is that not legitimate? Anybody want to comment on that or argue about it? You can tell me all day long, well, you're stupid to believe in God. And I go, yeah, me and 99.98% of all the other people who've ever lived. Neater, neater. I think one of the most profound experiences I ever had was as a young nursing student, a gentleman was being discharged, and I was taking him to the elevator, etc. And he said, you weren't there. And I said, what do you mean? 
He said, I used to never believe in God. I used to. And so I picked up my ears and turned around and said, oh, so what happened? I'm thinking, you know, he's reading a set of revelation or something. No, no, he had a cardiac arrest. And during that cardiac arrest, he saw himself above the bed, and all the nurses and doctors were there who did what and everything, and he talked to them all afterwards, and they all verified that, yes, that is what happened, and that's what they did, right. etc. And he said, you know, there was a lovely, quiet presence in the room, although there was what some people would call chaos, all the action activity. And he said, God was there, that's why I'm here. There have been a lot of people who testify to after you know near death experiences, mm -hmm. after life experiences. We always hear about the ones that were oh I saw a bright light and there was great warmth and I was welcomed and everything else and I saw people I love. The thing you don't hear a lot of record of is there have been as probably as many or more people who said they experienced health. They don't tend to want to talk about those. Those books don't sell as well. So um, you know the, the, the reality is that. We do have testimony, but I mean, think, think about let's think about this very practically for a minute. With all of these people down through history who have claimed that they've had an experience of God or the divine, are should we believe that? Now, some people would say, well, it's either you know a brain lesion or a repressive neuroses that they're suffering from. Well, if we think about <coughs> First, the consistency of the claims down through history. It's not like they're all over the map. Yeah, we have a few people who have seen God in alien spaceships and things like that. But they're very, very, very rare. So the consistency of the claims, and they do seem quite consistent down through history. Secondly, the character of the people who make those claims. These tend not to be the awful people in society. These people who claim experience of the divine tend to be those who are the saints. That's why we call them saints. Um, they have extraordinary morality, they have extraordinary decency, they tend to be trustworthy, self-sacrificial, they're not doing it for their own benefit. And their lives are changed and they frequently then become the vehicle for the change, a positive change in other people's lives. All of the evidence would indicate that these are not low lives who are trying to sell a bill of goods. Right? That it's not just lesions in the temporal lobe or, or repressed neuroses or anything else, but rather given the vast number of claims, the quality of the life of the people who tend to make that claim, they are, I mean, they're the best people in our in our societies. I mean, they're the Billy Grahams and the Mother Teresas and the and on and on and on. Not people that you would want to toss out. These are the ones who are most adamant about their own personal experience of the divine. And yet, and yet people say, oh no, that's, there's something wrong with them, or they're just mistaken, or they're just deluded, or they're, you know, they're neurotic, or whatever. And they say that about the majority of people who've ever lived. That doesn't fly with me. Don't think it should fly with anybody. And, and people also think, well, we're smarter than people used to be. No, you're not. You're not smarter, you're not better. This, called chronocentrism, this idea that our time, where, where the time we live in, is better. You know, we're smarter, we're, you know. I had an argument with a couple fairly recently who said, well, human beings are better now than they used to be. I, I said, better? You mean like morally better? And they said, yes. And I said, no, they're not. How can you possibly say that? And, and I said, do you know who Jack the Ripper was? And they went, of course. And I said, do you know why you know who Jack the Ripper was? And they said, well... I said, well, besides the fact they never caught him, he was the first recorded true serial killer. Meaning someone who killed people with whom he had no association and no motivation other than they had a profession. They were all prostitutes. The reason we know about him is not only because it was horrendous and graphic, and you know, and, and, but because he's the first one that we really know anything about. And yet, we got whole TV shows that focus on serial killers now. And we're getting better? What is that that keeps beeping? Uh, something keeps going beeping. Um, we're not getting better. We may be getting better at policing and controlling people from, t from doing the things they're motivated to do, but we're perfecting the sickest kind of awful now. 
And so we're not getting better. This is not a better time. People are not better and they're not smarter now than they were. Um, they're not. There may be new areas of endeavor because our technology allows us to look at things more closely than we didn't used to be able to see, but we're not smarter than we used to be. Don't ever let anybody tell you that. And so therefore, why should we think that the spiritual perceptions of people in the past or even today, but in the past were somehow deficient because people are smarter now than they were then? Poppycock. I'd like for anybody who says people are smarter now to read the first page of Kierkegaard's Sickness of the Death and tell me what it means. Um, try it sometime. I'm serious. It's a little tiny book. I read the first page of that book 50 times, and I still couldn't tell you what Kierkegaard's talking about. Okay. And not because he's just obtuse, because he was that deep. Okay. Um, I now want to get into the last thing we're going to talk about today is what's called Reformed Epistemology. And it basically asks the question, do we even need rational, apologetic arguments for God's existence? Many modern philosophers, and particularly we're talking about um, our hero, Alvin Plantinga, uh, William Lane Craig has dealt with this, Nicholas, Nicholas Waltersdorf, and a number of others, Michael Rhea, <coughs> have asked the question, um, the, the principles of, and they've looked at the principles of evidentialism, which says that no belief should be held unless one has sufficient evidence for it. This is kind of the argument that is accepted, at least, at least uh, passively accepted, by apologetics. You know, we need to show evidence for our belief in God. But, and, and we can say there is strong evidence for the existence of God, but why should belief in God require evidence of, at all? Why have we put ourselves in a place where we think we have to prove this? to somebody who doesn't believe it. See what I'm asking that question? Why are we on the defensive? You know, why are we trying to fight ourselves out of a corner by making arguments for the sake of God? Why can't we believe that perhaps belief in God is, a, is properly basic to our existence? Remember just a minute ago, I said the, that every culture we're aware of throughout all of history, human culture has had some belief in the divine or the supernatural. All people have, apparently, a sense of the divine, as Calvin called it, a sensus divinatus. John Calvin, the founder of Reformed Theology. That's why this is called Reformed Epistemology, because this goes back to the Reformers, especially. John Calvin talked about having the sense of the divine, the sensus divinatus, in the same way, this ability to perceive the divine, in the same way that we have visual, auditory, and other senses that require no further evidential support. If I say, well... I see that that's a white wall. Are you going to say, prove it? Well, I can see it. It's right there. Seeing is believing. Don't we have that expression? Now, it may be that if what you're seeing is questionable, you may be asked to, to defend it. But on a normal basis, all of us have sensory experiences that we accept as being a given as true and legitimate. And we have other people, other people's perceptions that we accept. Oh, I saw this new car, it just came out, and it's blah, blah, blah. I don't go, how do you know that what you saw was real? Prove it. Prove that what you perceived in that new car really happened, really was, that that really exists. They go, what is wrong with you? I just told you I saw it myself, right? Since human beings throughout history seem to have an inherent sense of perception of the divine, this, this sensus divinatus, why not believe and accept that that is a legitimate sense experience in the same way that all of our other senses are? It's not like it's rare. Reformed epistemology proposes exactly that. It insists that belief in God is properly basic. Those are Plantinga's words. Properly basic. Meaning inherent and acceptable in the same way that everything else is. It's properly basic to what we are as humans. Properly basic to humanity, that those who do not have such belief are broken or blinded. In this case, we would say by sin. In other words, people who don't have that sense have a disability. One of their inherent senses is not working right. Just like blindness or deafness or whatever. While we do have good arguments for the existence of God, such arguments are not necessary for a rational belief in God. It would be perfectly legitimate 
for somebody to say, well, I don't believe in God, and for me to say, I do, and they go, yeah, well, why do you believe in God? I go, well, why don't you? I've got just as legit much legitimacy. In fact, I've got more history behind me in terms of human experience to justify a properly basic sense of belief in God. Whereas you're playing with a brand new idea if you say you don't think there is a God. This is a new idea. Prove it to me that there isn't a God. Now, I would do that, but it would be a legitimate response. Does that make sense? Comments on that or questions about that? And to quote Plantinga, he says, when he talks about it being properly basic, he says that um, that means it is produced by cognitive faculties functioning properly, that is subject to no malfunctioning, in a cognitive environment congenial for those faculties according to a design plan, successfully aiming in truth. Those are big words saying that apart from any inherent brokenness in the system, this is a legitimate cognitive faculty that you perceive God. Martin? Well, I guess Satan was the first detective. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't think Satan was. Satan never questioned that there was a God. No, he, he always saw God. He, he, he's not going to be his God, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. That, and that's, that's a, uh, I know, another whole area, but it's amazing that that could happen. But we know it has, we know it has a purpose. Um, yeah. And, you know, that's the idea of us being blinded. There is a spiritual blindness. But we have a legitimate argument to say more people have the census divinatus that don't. So why do we feel like we have to defend ourselves on this? Fair. Ernest. Why did the title of reform in this knowledge? Because the, the primary, it's not exclusively so, it really started before that, but the primary arguments for it came from the reformers, and especially John Calvin. You know, he's the one that quoted Census Denonis. He's the author of Reformed Theology. And so they call it Reformed Epistemology. And remember the word epistemology means how do we know? Yeah. How do we know what we know? You know what, when we perceive something, how do we know it's true? And so the idea that it is an aspect of us knowing of God um, and reform goes back to, especially Calvin, but all of the, the time of the reformers and some of the work philosophically being done back then. Any questions or comments about that? Well, you get a break. You get a break for uh, um, two weeks. Two weeks and 45 minutes. <laughs> that's, that's all that I had for you today, unless there are other questions or comments.